Right. Yesterday we looked at the first principles idea of coming up with it, but having now done some exercises on that, um, you see, well, it's quite a tedious process to go through each time. But of course the beautiful thing about maths is we look for patterns and a formula lends itself to patterns. So let's have a look at it. If y is just a constant number, now again, we, we should know the answer to this, uh, because if y equals a constant number and we were to draw it, we'd end up with a horizontal line. Slope of a horizontal line is... Zero. That's it, zero. Don't all jump up at once there. <laughs> zero. So the derivative should turn out to be zero. Well, let's just prove it. So function x is equal to a constant. So therefore, function x plus h is a constant. Throw it into our derivative formula, and we're going to get constant minus constant, which is, of course, zero. So it does not matter. We're going to get zero every single time. So whenever we, this is our first rule, if you like. Differentiate a constant number, we're going to get zero. OK. What if it's a linear function? Again, we, we should know the answer to this, because a linear function, we know the slope would be the coefficient of x. So we're expecting k here. So we get k times x for function x, kx plus kh for function x plus h. Again, that's into our first principles formula. The kx cancels. I have kh on h, the h's now cancel. Okay. And we get a constant k. All right. So now, whenever we differentiate a linear function, we don't need first principles. We know it's just going to be the coefficient of x. Well, let's look at polynomials in general. Now, in order to do this, I need to remind you of something. Back when we looked at difference of two squares, you'll remember we had a minus b, a plus b, and then we said, oh, difference of two cubes was a minus b, a squared plus a, b plus b squared. But then we generalised that idea. We said, oh, hang on, we can, this pattern continues. If I have a to the power of 4 minus b to the power of 4, again, it will always start with a minus b. Powers of a go down by 1, powers of b going up by 1. So if I have a to the power of n minus b to the power of n, I'll have a minus b, powers of a will start at n minus 1, go down by 1, powers of b will go up by 1, so the, the two powers are always adding up to be n minus 1. Okay, so if I remember that idea, we can now say, well, function x is going to be x to the power of n. Function x plus h will be x plus h to the power of n. So when I sub it in, there it is, a to the power of n minus b to the power of n. Well, a in this case is x plus h, b is x. But we now know how to factorise that. It would be a minus b, so in this case, x plus h minus x. The powers of x plus h will start at n minus 1 and go down by 1. The powers of x will go up by 1. All right, well, we can tidy that up because x plus h minus x is just h, which will cancel with the h in the bottom, leaving me with x plus h to the power of n minus 1, x plus h to the power of n minus 1 times x, and so on and so on. But of course, we're going to substitute in h approaching 0. So x plus h just becomes x to the power of n minus 1. The next term becomes x to the power of n minus 2 times x, which is x to the power of n minus 1. And so on. So every one of those terms will be x to the power of n minus 1. The question is, how many do we have? Well, if we go back and have a look, difference of two squares in the second parentheses, we have two terms. Difference of two cubes in the second parentheses, we have three terms. Difference of two quartics, four terms. So logically, in a to the power of n minus b to the power of n, there must be n terms. Each one of them is x to the power of n minus 1. So we get n lots of x to the n minus 1. So whenever we differentiate x to the power of n, we get n times x to the n minus 1. So the power comes to the front, and we subtract 1 from the power. What about something with negative indices, though? So let's do 1 on x. Okay. Function x is 1 on x. Function x plus h is 1 on x plus h. Substitute in. Hmm. Some algebraic fractions there. So our common denominator will end up being x, x plus h, which I'll move to the denominator. On the top, I'll get x 
minus all of x plus h, so minus x minus h, leaving me with minus h on top, which will cancel with the h on the bottom. Now if I substitute in 0 for h, I get minus 1 on x squared. But here's the interesting thing. Had I done it using indices, I get x to the minus 1. And if I use that rule that we just created, I could say, all right, well, I'll, I'll get that power, I'll put it to the front, and subtract 1 from the power. So sure enough, that rule works not only for positive integers, it'll work for negative integers as well. So we can still use that idea of get the power, bring it to the front, and so on. So it works for positive integers, it works for negative integers. Let's see if it works for the fractions as well. So y equals the square root of x. Function x is the square root of x. Function x plus h will be the square root of x plus h. Right, there's our formula. Well, normally we rationalise the denominator. I'm going to rationalise the numerator. Still the same idea. I'll multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, so square root of x plus h plus square root of x. So on the top of the fraction, difference of two squares, we'll get x plus h minus x. On the bottom, h outside of the square root of x plus h plus root x x minus x cancels. Now, oh, the h cancels in top and bottom. But we're going to substitute in h approaching 0. So I now have 1 on root x plus root x, which is 1 on 2 root x. Okay, let, let's see what would have happened if we used indices. So x to the power of a half. Get that power, put it to the front, subtract 1 from the power. A half x to the minus half. Well, yeah, that is 1 on 2 root x. So again, we can use the idea not only for positive integers, we can use it for negative integers, we can use it for fractional integers as well. It works. x to the power of anything. We can use the idea. Well, that is going to save us a lot of time. Because now if we get a question like this, y equals 7, we can just sit back and laugh and go, ha, that's a bit easy. The derivative would be... Zero. zero. Constant always gives me zero. Uh, 30, y equals 37x. The derivative? 37, the coefficient of x. Uh, y is x to the power of 10. Well, we'll get that number, we'll put it to the front, and we'll subtract one. So 10x to the power of 9. Who said calculus was hard? Okay. 3x squared plus 6x plus 2. Well, you just differentiate each bit individually. So 3x squared, when I bring that 2 to the front, I just multiply it by whatever coefficient's there. So we get 6x plus 6. 2x plus 1 all squared. Oh, hang on. <sighs> Gonna have to expand this out. 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. Now I can go and differentiate. We get 8x plus 4. We will, in a very short amount of time, see an easier way of doing that. Y equals 3x plus 1 on x squared. Well, the 1 on x squared, I'm going to change to index form. And now I can use our rule. So the 3x will differentiate to give 3. The x to the minus 2, bring the number to the front, negative 2. Subtract 1 from the power, negative 3. I always like to write my answer to match the way the question is written. So because they didn't use negative in indices in the question, then I, I like to write my answer without the use of negative indices. I suppose a mere mortal would leave it as 3 minus 2x to the, to the minus 3, but us super mathematicians will go 3 minus 2 on x cubed. Y equals x squared root x. Got to change that to index form. So it's x squared and x to the half, two and a half, but of course we use improper fractions, so it's x to the five on two. <coughs> Power comes to the front, five on two, x to the three on two, mere mortal answer. X root x, five on two, x root x. If function x equals x cubed minus 3, find f dash 2. Now, make sure you're reading questions really carefully. It's so easy to make a mistake with this. I've seen people do it a stack of times where they're not 
reading it, um, well, sorry, they're reading it too quick. And so you know what they do? They just read it as, oh, find function two. Substitute in two, get the answer. But it's not saying that. We've got to find the derivative, which in this case is 3x squared. That's what we're substituting two into. So f dash two is three times two squared. 12, by the way, in case you haven't worked it out already, uh, three times two squared is 12. So all right, back to why we started all this. Let's find the equation of a tangent. Now I don't have to, imagine if I had to use first principles here. X plus H or Q, yeah, okay, we can do it, but it's going to, you know, take us a while. Now I can go, well, hang on. Equation of a tangent, thought process goes, ah, tangent, tangent's a line. I can find the equation of a line, I need two things. Those two things are point and a slope. I have a point, yay, slope. Oh no, I don't have a slope. That's okay, I can find the equation of a slope. All I need is two points on the line. Oh, I've only got one point on the line. Damn. Hang on. Calculus. To the rescue. All right. So that's basically the thought process. It goes a lot quicker than that, of course. Ah, let's find the derivative. Now, remember, 15x squared minus 12x is not the slope of the tangent. That is the formula that allows us to find it. In fact, sometimes you even see um, the derivative called the gradient function. So it's the function that finds the gradient. All right, we want to know when x equals 1. So substitute in, and we get a, a slope of 3. So, okay, the slope I want is 3. Point slope formula, and now I can find the equation of that uh, particular tangent. Find the points on this particular curve where the tangents are horizontal. The tangents are horizontal. Well, what it's essentially saying is find the lines where the slopes are equal to zero. Well, it's the derivative that finds the slope, so now I'm interpreting the question, ah, it's asking me to find when is that derivative equal to zero. So let's put that all together. Y is x cubed minus 12x. The derivative is 3x squared minus 12. We want to know when the tangents are horizontal. So then you're working out, you explain what you're doing. Don't just all of a sudden magically go, oh, let's make this equal to zero. Someone's reading your solution, they're gonna go, why, why did you just make this equal to zero? So explain why. I know tangents are horizontal when that derivative is equal to zero. So in other words, I wanna solve 3x minus 12 equals zero. I get two possibilities. So there must be two times, they're the x values. Sub in to get the y values, and there they are. Minus 2, 16, and 2, minus 16. Introduce a term here, a normal. And all a normal is, is a line that is perpendicular to the tangent. So a normal is, is another way of saying a perpendicular. So at the particular point of contact. So if, there we go, there's random graph. There's my tangent the normal would look something like that. So at right angles to the tangent at the particular point. So if we had to find the equation of the normal, again, the thought process kicks in. Ah, normal is a line. Ah, line, need a point, slope. And eventually we get to, ah, calculus. But hang on, I could only find the slope of the tangent. Ah, but it's perpendicular to the tangent. So there's a little extra bit now. I've got to go negative inverse. Let's find the derivative, 8x minus 3. When x equals 3, the derivative is 21. But that's the slope of the tangent. So therefore, the slope I want is negative 1 on 21. Sub it in, beautiful numbers, really. I, I don't know why I randomly picked this one. 21 times 29, that's 609. Uh, so we get this beautiful two. x plus 21y minus 612 is equal to 0. <laughs> Okay. You'll see I've just put there a note on setting out. Okay. When differentiating, you're actually solving an equation. You're still solving an equation. And the basic idea of a solving an equation is what you do to one side, you do to the other. So we write down y equals x squared plus 2x. We're starting with this equation. So what I do to one side, I do to the other. Now, this second line I put in, we don't actually write down, but what we're actually saying is, hey, I'm gonna differentiate both sides, 
with respect to x. Now on the left hand side, differentiate y with respect to x, how do I do that? I don't know what that is. So I just leave it as differentiate y with respect to x. But on the right hand side, I do know how to differentiate x squared plus 2x with respect to x, and so we write the y dx. So let's say, second line we don't actually write down, but that's really what we're doing. It's an equation. What I do to one side, I do to the other. So I'm differentiating both sides with respect to x. Okay? And I mentioned this yesterday. I, I like to match the notation that's being used. So if I start with y equals x squared plus 2x, then I'll say dy dx equals, or maybe y dash. But if I start with function x equals, then I'll go f dash x. So I match the notation that's being used. The third way I might do it is just simply say, well, if they've asked me to differentiate x squared plus 2x, I might write it down as, okay, I'm going to differentiate x squared plus 2x with respect to x, and the answer is 2x plus 2. Never write down x squared plus 2x equals 2x plus 2. I see that in working out. But that's, it's not true. What you're saying is mathematically wrong. Okay, so you have to say, no, 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 y is x squared plus 2x, or function x is x squared plus f dash x is 2x plus 2. Okay.